What are we going to follow this morning? And now we're checking, there's, there'll be few signs that will be leading you to find these animals. And the only way to tell or to be convinced that you're going to find the animals is through edging the tracks. And this is one of the signs. These are zebra tracks. And from the tracks, you will be able to tell how fresh the tracks are. And for me, these are all tracks. The zebra walked past here just after the rain, just before the rain. As you can see, there's grass on top and the, with the grass, which is dry, it also helps you to tell that the tracks are not that fresh. And therefore, we'll be looking for very fresh tracks, which will be convinced that trying to follow the animal, the chances are there that we can find the animal. So was this piece of grass put on top of the track, maybe from the zebra biting down, eating something, and then not all the grass perhaps going inside of its mouth and dropping back on its track? Is that what's possible? Okay, or maybe it even just kicked it out. But that's incredible. I, so it's something that you would completely overlook. And like Herbert said, these are old tracks. So we're going to head to the road just down the way, and hopefully we're going to pick up on some fresh ones. Should we head on over over there? Yes. So Herbert, we have a request from James and James would like to know this morning, can we find a track but specifically left by a bird? Do you think we can do that? Yes, we can. I think the road would probably be a yeah. good option. So we see all the different animals often crossing over the road and at night time we get birds like night jars and a couple of other types of things crawling, well not crawling, heading onto the road because we always see those big beetles and millipedes and all sorts of other creepy crawlies crossing around there, even the odd scorpion. So let's go and have a look and see what the newspaper has for us this morning. Right. Now, this is going to really test me. I don't know when I last looked at bird tracks. The only one I can identify is, of course, a dove's track from the crazy way that they walk. But let's, let's have a little search here. Obviously, Herbert's got the good eyes, though. He's the expert, and I feel very confident that he's with us this morning, so he can help make sure that we give the right answer, of course, to the track. Now, normally, you see lots of bird tracks all over the road. It seems as though for now, they haven't quite walked just here. We'll get them though. We'll get them eventually. It's such a beautiful morning. And <clears throat> well, we always do insects and flowers and things and we know that they're not gonna race away. So I thought that, that we'd try something a little bit different this morning. And I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying having chats to Herbie and hearing about him as he grow. he's grown up in this area. And, uh, well, it's great for me too because I get to learn about one of the most amazing mentors. He probably doesn't realize how incredible he really is and how much value I gain from him. So I'm enjoying it. And then, of course, well, tracking is so much fun as well. I haven't been able to do this, not only just identifying the tracks, and you see us tracking in vehicles a lot, but to be able to walk and trail an animal is some skill. Remember, they don't always walk on these roads. So when they cross off, maybe they just go like this and off they go. Then you've got to find other things. The ground might be too hard, can't pick up any tracks. You've got to look for small signs. Which way is the grass bending? Maybe they'd walked in the morning, there was a bit of dew, and you can actually see which way an animal has gone. Look for signs of a buffalo has been wallowing in the mud. They'll often leave bits of mud on grass and passing vegetation as they go past. That's something you can look. But we're going to have another search for the bird tracks. It seems as though they've avoided this stretch of road. But don't disappear for too long. We're going to send you across to Evia, who's got a couple of beautiful Inyala. We've actually found a male, a female, and a baby Inyala. It looks like the male is trying to figure out if this female is ready for mating again i don't think she's going to be very receptive that baby is still very young i wonder if i go forward if we'll get a visual of the baby it's just to the left of the mum in a little it's just behind this fallen tree let's 
discreetly squeeze forward. It was quite shy when we just got here. It would help if I take off the handbrake. <laughs> I'm so envious of you having so much fun with Brent and seeing all the spotted cats this morning. Leopard and cheetah. There we go. Tiny baby. I don't think this is very old. Maybe a month or two old. So I can't see how the mother is ready for mating yet. But the male is definitely trying to attach himself to the female. You can see wherever she moves, he's following almost like he's become her tail. <laughs> yeah, the female's not having any of that. <clears throat> So unfortunately we have any luck with finding lion tracks so far. We're still exploring, we're still figuring things out. See if we can, we can get any luck. We're going to go past Buffalzook Dam shortly. See if there's anything at the water. We saw some <laughs> hippo tracks earlier on the road. So maybe there's a hippo waiting for us there. Let's slowly but surely keep going and see what else we can find. So I heard the cheetahs were chasing zebra around. That's a bit. That's a big prey to try and catch. Or were they just playing with them? And they're just chasing each other around for <laughs> for a bit of fun, for a bit of a laugh. We're approaching the dam just behind it, yeah. I think I'll ne I don't think I'll ever forget this dam. It's the same dam with the Just some Egyptian geese and Looks like white faced whistling ducks as well. I don't see any terrapins sunning themselves. Folks, while we keep searching and Exploring this area. Um, we're gonna head over to Taylor again. She has got a nice trekking surprise So James after walking many 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 miles now I'm just joking it wasn't quite miles down the road We eventually picked up on a bird track and I'm gonna let Herbert tell you about it because well He's got I think he's got a much better explanation than I would so Herbie what track is this? These are Franklin's tracks heading in that direction. So where's the front toe? This is the longest toe in the middle and the two on the sides. Okay. And the back toe here. Just a small little claw coming out of the foot. So it obviously crossed the road. Crossed the road coming from the west yes. to the east. But then what happened to the rest of its tracks because I can't and see now, them anymore. And now from this track 
you hardly see the tracks here be simply because there was a car that drove after the Franklin walked past the road. So obviously the tracks have been driven over here. You can only see more tracks here. Look how faint that is. I just have to emphasize how incredible Herbert's eyes are is that there's a couple of shadows falling into this track which actually helps make it stand out a little bit more. But you can see it's just crossing over here and it's faint. I mean this is very old, isn't it Herbie? This is very odd. The tracks have been uh, obliterated because of the wind that blows on top of the tracks. Yeah, so, so all the sand that yeah. has gone on top of it. Yeah. Okay, and then where does it go after there, Herbert? From here. This one here. My goodness. There it gets a little bit this difficult. One here. Oh my goodness, Herbert, you're incredible. And there's one here. With, you only see the, the two toes on the sides and the half of the middle toe and the rest of the middle toe has been driven over. And more tracks here. So now with these tracks, since the tracks have been um, driven over, the chances for us to find these uh, bed are very slim. So that's how you, you, you tell how are the chances for you to find these. Um, it's, uh, if it's an animal, how are the chances for you to find the animal? In the case of a bed, the chances are very slim. And since the tracks have been covered by the sand, it tells you that it might be from early this morning not that fresh and we only get convinced after um, seeing how fresh are the tracks that we, the chances are there for us to find the animal so in this case very slim chance. So we're not going to follow these. We're not going to follow these. Okay, well, we won't, we won't harp too much then on the bird tracks, but James, there we go. Herbie showed you a wonderful Franklin track. We're going to carry on along the road until we find another, of course, uh, um, uh, big animal pathway. And I believe you're looking at us from the air, if I'm not mistaken. And, well, you probably see the game paths now a lot better than what we could see them down here. And that is because the brush is so thick in this area now it of course makes it very difficult but we're standing on a road the road forks well we're probably going to head further uh, well sort of southwest now <laughs> it goes the drone off it goes buzzing overhead herbert's waving vm's walking backwards now we we're gonna like i said we're gonna carry on going down this road until we can pick up one fresh trick and well hopefully of course uh, that track will then veer off onto a nice animal pathway and let's keep our fingers crossed that the sand is well nice and soft and fluffy like what you can see here and like what we looked at earlier because that will make for a great tracking experience but like i said we're not tracking any big game today we're going to be looking for something small a steer and bulk maybe an impala a water buck you name it uh, and it's nice to go out and track uh, the big animals of course as well especially when we're looking for lions and things like that but uh, today we're going to do it different the, I think the things like the impala and the steenbok or a common dacre, they are much more difficult to track than something that's big and large because those sort of things, they don't really have a pattern. If they get spooked, they may dash some other way. They might run back around, do a loop and come straight over their tracks again. Now we're looking here and, and as you can see and, and what Marianne has just pointed out she said that you can see a couple of the more grasses growing in the middle of the road. Now exactly like this one here trying to spread its roots and hopefully creep over to better soils. Now Marianne you're wondering if this will affect us finding tracks. At the moment it's really not too bad because if something were to stand on this you probably see like we saw with the bird track half a track a toe a claw mark or whatever it really may be so this is all right but the fire breaks the fire breaks that are not being driven on a regular basis will now regrowth and a flush of vegetation will come through and well then that'll make it difficult to track on there herbert what do you have here oh has somebody come across the road so these are hyena tracks running oh my goodness where i don't even know oh you're looking right here look at that so which way has it come from this side? It came from this side. As you can see here, got the, the, the sand has been pushed back. So the animal was running in that direction. If you're not sure 
how big or how tall is the animal you can use a stick like this and this will actually help you to to tell okay yes. what sort of to sell to tell the gate so the length of the step of the animal no, you, you use the gate yes to measure how tall is the how tall the animal is the animal is okay like here i've got this stick measuring the gate yeah so this is one foot there's the other foot over the there foot. okay and now you take this stick to the middle of the tracks and this is how tall the hyena would that be the shoulder height though yeah. okay okay very cool that's quite amazing now what was it you said it was running here yes it was okay. running. so it probably um it could have been for anything. It could have been responding, responding to a call to a down there, call or, or maybe to another hyena. Yes. It probably it does look. It doesn't look too old. Do you think that this was quite early this morning? Early this morning. Maybe dashing back to get home before mom catches that hyena out of bed, as maybe it snuck out for the night. I'm not sure. Right, we still haven't found the track that we are looking for, but we'll get there eventually. We're going to go all the way across to Cheetah Plains to see how Brent is doing with the leopards. Do you see a leopard, Dave? Nope. No, it's because there's no leopards here. Uh, no, there's other vehicles in there, so we're just going to do a quick loop around Cheetah Plains uh, before we head back towards Inkanyeni and uh, Vutomi. The survivor or sole survivor uh, named by Shanae. Oh, I don't know, I'm not sure what that name means. I'm, if anyone out there knows what Vutomi means, please let me know. I did know I've forgotten. Uh, but it is a, a really. Ah, there we go. Michael, thank you. It means life. Uh, now, apparently, the female cub hasn't been seen in some time. And so there is a possibility she's expired, but uh, you never know, that's the thing. You never know, these animals surprise us constantly. Now, I did see some elephant tracks uh, while we're following those cheetah, and I'm just coming to check uh, the Kruger boundary, and I was hoping we might spot an oily front or two, but it looks like they might have gone all the way into Kruger. Uh, I can't tell you what Dave exactly said to me when he spotted it. Uh, it was something along, what the hell is that? And I was very excited and grabbed the radio to call uh, uh, Rebecca saying, quick link, quick link, pangolin. And uh, Rebecca being from Johannesburg, and uh, wasn't quite sure what it was at the time. So she went to Jamie, said, Lick to Brent. Armad armadillo. I think she was trying to say armadillo. So Jamie, uh, of course, immediately assumed that it was a, an armored lizard or a plated lizard. Uh, but of course, my frantic waving at the camera, <laughs> you have to come now. And she realised it might not be a lizard uh, in the fall final control. Did it might be something a little bit more important? Uh, the only one ever seen on Safari Live. Aren't you lucky, Dave? Oh. You get to drive around with me. Oh, well, I did spot it. Ah, now we're going to keep looping around in Cheetah Plains to see what other wonderful things we can find. It has been incredibly productive this morning, but it sounds like Effia has found an animal we haven't seen too many of over the last couple of weeks. And uh, one that Effia, I think, quite likes and tries to copy from time to time. So let's go have a look. So I found my example that I did yesterday on the bushwalk with my little swim in the mudwater. A couple of buffalo bulls. I've been told you haven't been seeing much of them. Um, I think they've been following a bit of the rain around and in some areas further east into the Kruger Park that there's a lot of good grazing that they would have gone to. But it's good to see and have them back here. And they're also looking a lot healthier. There's, the hip bones are not sticking out as much as they as they used to the last time I was in the Sabi Sands. These guys are looking good. Getting their strength back. It's a scary thought when they get too strong. 
doesn't look like they've been in the mud recently. See beautiful males. You can see the two two lying down are very relaxed, but this one that's up he looks quite intrigued by us. Buffalo always make me laugh when they look so serious. He's um, always got that perfect poker face. I think if we had to play poker against these guys, we'd lose every time. So, I found a little bit of <clears throat> interesting reading yesterday. We've got the big five and the magnificent seven, the big five being lion, leopard, buffalo, rhino and elephant. Adding on to the magnificent seven would be wild dog and cheetah. And these guys are part of the three dangerous bees. So it is buffalo, bushbuck and bush pig. We're going to head over back to to Brent. He's got a nice surprise and a bit of activity for you. Well, it seems like it's a carnivore-driven drive this morning. Uh, a side-striped jackal in our wanderings on cheetah plains has appeared. Isn't that wonderful? I haven't seen side-striped for quite a while. Uh, we saw black back the other day around Sydney's dam, but I haven't seen the side-striped. Oh, it's tired and it's hot. Found a nice gory bush to lie under. Now, of the two jackal species, the side striped is the the more omnivorous of the two, and a very very wide ranging diet. And depending on where you find them, uh, in certain areas, up to 60% of their 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 food will be fruits. Now, I worked in Zambia for quite a while. And we had some, I uh, was running some islands in Lake Kariba and some biggish islands are around 800, 900 hectares. And I was trying to restock uh, some indigenous predators onto the islands. And one of the things I wanted to put onto the islands was a side striped jackal. And of course, I was trying to catch them. I had made some traps and I baited them with impala guts. And all I managed to catch we're bush pig, who are also, of course, omnivores. I, I wasn't planning to move bush pigs to the island, but I caught enough to move to the island. And, of course, then uh, we got a call from one of the local villagers that the bush pig were really, really playing havoc in one of the guy's uh, uh, ground nut plantations. And he asked us if we would come help him with the bush pig so i said okay well i'll go catch a few more bush pig uh, except this time i didn't use impala guts i used watermelon thinking that would be the best thing to catch a bush pig and i caught side striped jackal so very interesting and they do eat a lot of the indigenous melons and they will raid crops for melons and tomatoes and all sorts of things so a great survivor and omnivore they also eat quite a lot of insects Wonderful. Nice to see one. I love how alert they are. Look at those ears. Yes, yeah, listening to every word. Now, Amber's wondering, do jackals travel in packs or are they solitary? Oh, they actually live in pairs. And it's not uncommon to find the pairs separate from each other while foraging. But they will live in pairs and they will raise young together. And when the young reach just under a year old, they are chased away by their parents. And they need to go move off and find their own territory. But so uh, they don't live in packs or singularly, they live in pairs. And are quite monogamous as well. Hey, little one. Well, good news. We're heading back towards the leopards now. Uh, catch up with Nkanyini and Vutomi. Oh, and I'm hoping they might even be there for the sunset safari because I think I might skedaddle down here again.
Uh, it's turning into a very, very bright day. There is still a massive cloud bank to the east, and I'm not sure what it's going to do during the day, during the day. Uh, to quote one of my favourite authors, and there's two things you should never predict: the weather, and I get into trouble if I say the second one. But uh, well, we'll say it. I'm feeling naughty on a Monday morning. Uh, two things one should never predict: the weather and a woman's moods. Good old Hemingway. Uh, Although I suppose he did get hit over the head by a few women during his time. Of course, a great, a great advocate for Africa, Ernest Hemingway. And one of the more famous Hemingway quotes on Africa is that uh, there was never a morning that I woke up in Africa and I wasn't happy. I must admit, I agree with good old Ernest there. Okay, we are going to head towards those leopards while we do that. It seems like Taylor is playing with poo again. Now, one of the things that I always found really tricky when I first started guiding was to be able to tell the difference between a porcupine and, of course, a honey badger track. Now, there's a couple of very obvious differences, but, well, sometimes you can only really see them if the substrate is nice and soft. But come and have a look over here. Now, let's go, Jay, let's take a knee. This is a big foot. You can see there's toes. There's part of a pad. And you can see how how long it really is. It looks like it's been stepped over again, so twice. So I would probably say that that's the, one of the tracks. And then you can see, I think it's obviously it's sort of um, superimposed itself. So something has stood in, into it again, probably the, the honey badger. Now, the reason how I know that this is indeed a honey badger and not a porcupine is because the track is quite broad. A porcupine track is quite narrow and often you'll see little lines, not as big as that stick, but little faint lines behind the track. And every now and then the porcupine forgets to lift up its quills and while well, they drag around the ground. Now, if you're still not convinced and you're still a little bit uncertain, you don't have to stay focused on a track. And that's one of the things that you're taught is, as you're taught, sorry, is look around. Don't get so absorbed into what you're doing. Take a step back, take a deep breath if you're doing a tracking assessment and you're unsure and look around you. We followed those tracks and come and look what we found. Now it gets a bit tricky here as we go towards this midden. You can see the dung beetles have been hard at work working away all this dung. So this is very difficult. It doesn't really leave a track. But then when you come in here you start to notice these strange diggings. Can you see there's a digging? There's another digging and another one. And another one, and another one, and another one, and they're all over this entire midden. But then, down over here, it's sort of, oh, I've now come undone. <laughs> Let me put my mic pack back across onto my belt. Right, here it is, back in again. EAP, oh my goodness, I'm falling apart. But if you come down over here, I think we need a smaller stick. Look at this. Now this is feces, of course, and I'm not going to touch it with my hands. If you look very closely, let me open up, you should be able to tell what this is. Here we go. Yeah, does that look very obvious to you? Well, not really. Okay, if you, if you are struggling, we're going to get through here and I'm going to find a bit of a scorpion. Anyway, you can see, here we go, there's a couple of claws in here. Here's some legs. Can you see those? Now that is from a scorpion. At one point we did have the skin, uh, the sting, but unfortunately it's in here something. So if you saw that and you weren't convinced that it was a, a porcupine, a porcupine doesn't eat scorpions, but the honey badger does. And one of their favorite things to do is to dig in dug middens looking for beetles, larvae, scorpions, and a variety of different things. And I suspect that it was probably more than one, just because there were quite a few different patches of, uh, of feces. So I think maybe it could have been mom and maybe Maybe her youngsters, maybe one youngster, maybe two youngsters. It's a bit difficult to tell. This road was driven on a substantial amount early hours of the morning. 
but we're going to carry on walking we're still looking for a mammal's track to try and follow a honey badger would be a very difficult one to try and follow because honey badger does, doesn't know any rules and they really just do what they want so we'll try and get something a little bit easier uh, sort of to predict their movements if we do lose their tracks so that's another thing if you have good morning Alana who is 13 years old now you were wondering is it possible to tell the age of an animal just by looking at its track and you're quite right and and all you've got to do is look at the size of it because like impala you get or oh, adult impala you get baby impala too and that was something that actually used to trick us quite a lot is you overthink and you overlook some of these tracks you think oh, oh I don't know what this is it looks like an impala track but it can't be an impala track because it's too small and that's when you want to just smack yourself over the back of the head and go it's a baby impala so yes you can definitely do so it would be a little bit difficult of course um, because well I don't know ex if you could give it an exact age but you could get a rough estimation uh, especially if the adults track was right next to it and you could sort of gauge how how old it is but it would be a very very rough estimate we're obviously much better at sort of determining age by physically looking at an animal my goodness it is hot <laughs> out here now the Sun is pelting down and well it's a good day for tracking I suppose and um, I think the light is good it's not an overcast cloudy day we can see things nice and clearly We're going to have to catch up with Herbert for the next question. <laughs> Shame Vim. Vim's going backwards now at the moment. He's doing his exercise for the day. So Michael will get, we'll catch up with Herbie and then we'll ask him. I'm coming. I'm coming, Vim. <laughs> oh, Vim says he used to do athletics, so he's used to this. Yeah, he was, so, and then he used to be a cameraman. So I reckon if there was a race for all the cameramen that filmed athletics, my money's probably going to be on Vim. He does this very, very well. Herbie, we have a question. Herbert's here. So Herbert, Michael would like to know what, in your opinion, is the most difficult animal to track. Um, it's a leopard. A leopard. It's a leopard. Why a leopard? Um, because when you follow up on leopard tracks, especially the one hunting, it won't go like in a straight line. They used zigzagging, zigzag, yeah, like going on top of the termite mounds, under the trees, scent marking, and it will do that while hunting. So in that case, he would be looking or she would be looking for. Uh, for the prey species, mm. which I will not be like in one area, so mm. it will be in a zigzag form. Okay. It makes it difficult, especially looking at the tiny tracks to the size of a leopard. Okay, so there we go, Michael, you've heard that. Herbert says that, well, a leopard, specifically a hunting leopard, is one of the hardest of, uh, animals to try and track. But speaking of spotted cats, I believe Brent is sitting with a few. Here we go, we're still within Kanyeni, and uh, I must admit, out of the cats, leopards probably are the hardest to track, but mm, the hardest animal to track, I would say, is a dragonfly or a butterfly. Only joking, of course. So you can see it's, it's heating up quite, quite quickly now. It's probably close on 85 to 90 Fahrenheit already. And then we've got Nkanyen lying in the shade with her nice big belly. There's the remnants of an impala kill in the marula tree behind us. But oh, it's pretty much done skis. There's nothing left there. Uh, I can't see where Vutomi is now, but I'm sure he's not far. Also probably got his own little spot of shade that he is reclining in. Now... If Karula is the queen of Juma, Nkanyeni is certainly the queen of the east. Uh, we don't get to see her as nearly as often as I'd like because she is, a lot of her territory extends into, into the Kruger. So she does spend quite a lot of time outside of the Sabi Sands. But when she is around, she is spectacular. even if she is dozing. Now, it's thought that uh, Shivambalan 
is the father of Vutomi. Now, with with when it comes to leopards, uh, a lot of a lot of people uh, definitely like to speculate who who's the daddy. Now, unfortunately. Uh, as much as we would like to speculate, without genetic testing, it's impossible to say. Uh, female leopards will mate with up to four or five males during uh, the Easter cycle. And the reason they do this is so that any male that comes into contact with those cubs will think that they've possibly fathered that cub and therefore hopefully not kill it. Now, and uh, so it is very difficult to say. It's likely that the dominant leopard, that the, that the, the female uh, dominant male that the female's territory mostly encompasses is likely to be the father but again uh, without genetics it is literally impossible to say. Now Stephanie is wondering why in, in Singapore is wondering why is she breathing so heavily. Well Stephanie it's because she's got a full belly. Now uh, leopards unlike human beings are unable to sweat so we cool down by sweating and then the cold or the breeze or whatnot on us causes evaporation which cools us down there. and uh, when we're hot um, our actual blood comes closer to the skin and our veins become thicker when it's cold it contracts so when we want to try get rid of that heat and when it's when it's really really cold we're trying to keep our heat in now the only way for her to get rid of heat easily is by breathing so if we look there so the closest sort of blood vessels and veins and whatnot are going to be in her mouth and on her tongue so what she does is those will be heavily extended and as she breathes they'll cool down um, the blood and send it through to the rest of her body now with as with a lot of the big cats uh, heat is a, is a big problem for them and that's why they generally tend to be nocturnal or move around when it's cooler and uh, not so bad in leopards but in lions if their core body temperature raises even by about two or three degrees it actually puts them uh, in in critical dangers and the fact that they might uh, might not survive. Um, I've only ever heard of one case of that actually being seen in the South Luangwa. Uh, what happens is uh, if their body temperature does get too hot, they become delirious, confused, and uh, of course then they don't get out of the sun, don't cool down. So it can be quite dangerous. It, it doesn't really happen too often. It's a very extreme thing uh, when that does happen. But that's why on hot days, especially on hot summer days like today, uh, you're going to find most leopards will be well well in, in some deep shade and breathing heavily. And the other reason she's breathing so heavily is because she's got a belly full of food. So remember, when you eat, and you tend to get a bit warmer after you eat, and the digestive process uh, does heat you up. Oh, here comes Votomi. See him? Oh, he's laying down. There he is. So I said he was he's never going to be too far off. Yeah, let's try to see if we can get a bit of a closer look at Mr. Votomi and while we head in that way. Gigi would like to know, isn't a leopard's vision in black and white? Uh, indeed it is, Gigi. Uh, it's all more in shades of grey. Now, that's obviously to help them with their, their nocturnal vision as well. And their eyes are very differently designed to ours. They're designed to focus on movement. So they don't see detail. For example, a leopard wouldn't be able to read the back of a book. Uh, it would only be able to see that there was something there. So their eyes are very specifically designed to pick up movement uh, and that's why there's that old adage when it comes to being out in the bush. Most animals eyes are designed to pick up movement. Whatever you do, don't run. And uh, often because if you keep dead still, a lot of animals will actually lose sight of you because you are not moving. So there is young Vutomi. Hello, mister. Growing up very quickly, if I remember, he's probably 13 or 14 months old now. He is getting to probably one of the nicest ages for young male leopards. They are very playful 
and inquisitive with life. So between a year and two years is sort of my favorite time to spend with a, a young male leopard because they are so full of life and mischief. Now of course each individual leopard has its own personality and I haven't seen spent enough time with Vutomi to, to get to know his personality too well just yet. Hopefully that's going to change. And you, know, you can see he's a 3-3 spot pattern. For those of you who are wondering about spot patterns and how we identify leopards, let me just get a here we go. A clickety oh no, that's a terrible clickety click. My stuff is all set from last night in the dark. So I'm just going to get a shot of his face so I can show you. Um, what I'm talking about when I say spot patterns. What is wrong with my camera? It is misbehaving heavily at the moment. There we go. Mr. Vutomi. That should be... No, it's still very dark. It's very strange. So, well, I sort out... Uh, I don't know what. It's not listening to me. My camera is not listening to me. Uh, we're going to sit here with these leopards for a little bit longer. And while we do that, let's go see how F is doing on foot. Welcome back. While we've been driving around after our buffalo sighting, we've had a wildebeest cross the road in front of us and bolt into the bush. We had some impala. We just had a little steenbok run in front of us and disappear into the bush. It's amazing how shy some of these creatures can be. Um, we still have had no luck with the lions or finding any tracks. So I think for this morning we're gonna leave the, the idea of tracking these lions I've often found when you stop focusing on one thing you might get lucky with something else or the thing that you were focusing on just appears as well so maybe we still get lucky we'll keep our hopes up but we're not gonna focus on that anymore um, so yeah let's let's see what else the bush will provide maybe we'll drive around the corner and something amazing will jump up Soraya in New Jersey, you are asking a very valid question, very good question. Is there a reason why there is less elephant and giraffe activity in our area in this time of the year? After the rains, your grazing and browsing changes. So there's places that might have had a little bit more rain that elephants might have migrated or moved towards. When it starts raining well and there's a good amount of grass, elephants change their diet a tiny bit and, and start feeding more on grass. So at the moment, this area where we are in Juma, the grass is quite short still, so there's not much for them to, to utilize. I think that might have been the main reason why we're seeing less elephants. Giraffe, I think it is a bit more random at the way they move and um, and do their thing. I don't think that's there's any particular reason for for us not seeing a huge amount of them. Um, they might just surprise us and come back. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's a beautiful scene where we're at now, a beautiful valley opening up in front of us. Amazing cloud cover and it slowly looks like it's it's building. It's it's promising signs. And it's 
almost all around us there's a bit of cloud cover. Hopefully it'll come in and 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 give us the water that we desperately need. Areas like this where you've got this amazing scenery and wherever you look you just see nature and, and all conservation areas. I love just sitting in the quiet and listening and taking everything in. Jason, you are asking if I've ever witnessed the Great Migration in the Maasai Mara. I haven't. I haven't been fortunate enough to, to head up to East Africa and, and go and see that. It is definitely on my bucket list and I hope to do it fairly soon. If I get my things in order, that's one of the first things I'll be up, up and planning and getting myself into into an area like that it would be amazing so soon very soon i think i must get that trip on the on the, on the cards and get going there's a spider hunting wasp that's just gone down in front of us just to the left of the road there's a random stick oh, it's flown off again hunting looking for for a meal. Folks, while we keep looking and exploring and seeing what the rest of the drive is going to bring us, we're going to head over to Taylor on Bushwalk. Um, just before we go, I'd like to challenge her to the Woodland Kingfisher call. So let's see how, how she goes. There's not a chance in the world I'm going to stoop that low and try and do another woodland kingfisher call because I did a number of attempts yesterday afternoon and I'm sure you all hear me and are still traumatized by that horrendous experience. But I do hope that Evia and Brent have done their calls because it's only fair out here. It can't just be me looking silly. Anyways, we found some leftovers from the honey badger again. I, d I don't know if it's the same honey badger, but if you come around and have a look over here, you can actually see that there's a sting. Let me go down. There's a sting left over from a scorpion. And you can actually see the effort that the honey badger has put in with its massive claws. It obviously watched this scorpion maybe move for cover or maybe it saw it or felt it moving around. And it dug all the way and you can see the roots from the grasses sticking out. And it managed to pull out the scorpion. And well, that's not a tasty treat to eat. Now, Amber, you were just wondering if it is dangerous for animals to eat scorpions. Now, the thing with venom is, is that you can eat it. As long as you don't have any stomach ulcers or any open wounds inside your stomach, you'll be fine. Because venom, it's not a poison. It actually needs to get directly into your bloodstream to really cause any harm. So, but you saw that that honey badger was quite clever. It removed the sting and then ate the rest of it. But we did see in the previous dung that they can also eat the sting, though. And so it's not too much of a problem. Now, it was here. We're not going to dwell too much in this area because there's a big animal pathway that I'd like to head over to and see if we can't pick up on any antelope tracks. So let's move on around there. But it seems as though honey badgers were very busy last night. Oh, VM, watch those holes. Have a little look here. Now, because it is so hot at the moment, there's going to be lots of little critters and creatures and things using these small shrubs as a as shelter. And I'm just checking underneath them to see if there's maybe a tortoise or anything along those lines around here. But no, it doesn't look like there is today. Let's jump onto this animal pathway. Now, it's been tough because a lot of the animal pathways seem to have grown over some of those smaller networks that I was telling you about. Sorry, my earpiece is coming right out of my eggs. Get back in there. And um, it's really just the bigger pathways now that are left open and the grasses haven't quite 
encroached on over. Just scan around here. Oh, come and have a look. Here's actually some impala. Speaking of them, can you see them all the way over there? They probably heard me. And it looks like it's a bachelor herd. Now they're staring at us, so they know we're here. But they haven't given off an alarm yet. They haven't started racing away. So they're obviously quite comfortable with us. And as we move once more, they, they darted off. So we won't, we won't stay and bother them for too much longer. We'll go around here and see if we can pick up on some other fresh tracks. Try and choose the least, most difficult way for them to navigate through here. We'll weave like the leopard when it's stalking something. Now, speaking about honey badgers and porcupines this morning, we've really only uh, sort of uh, touched. Uh, Lana was wondering, what do porcupines eat? So they prefer to eat roots. So you can also get confused by the digging from a porcupine and perhaps think that it could possibly be a honey badger looking for a scorpion like we saw. But the, the key to the sign there is that you have to have to look at the roots and you'll see that they would nibble away at the roots. So you'll actually see not quite the teeth mark but the broken bits, etc. So that's one of the main differences. But Herbie's signaling us. I think he's got something just up ahead. We'll go over and uh, have a quick look what he's found for us. We've actually, we've come to this big animal. Herbie, is this the animal pathway you were talking about? Herbie, is this the animal pathway you were talking about? Come and have a look here. I just want to show you, look how much this animal pathway has sort of disappeared. You can see it on the right, and you can see how there is quite a bit of grass starting to cover it now. But I suppose when the big groups of animals eventually come back, these roads will be utilized a lot more and then they'll become quite worn. Well, what have we got, Herbert? Impala tracks. Impala tracks, okay. Very nice. Okay, so if you have a look, like Herbert's just pointed out, he said that you can see this tiny little one. I'm going to try it. You can see Herbert's pointing at it because my shadow keeps going in it. It's a tiny little track. That's from the baby impala. You can see at the end that the very, very round tips, quite pointy here. It almost reminds me of a heart, but not a big, fat, round heart, a sort of long and narrow heart. That's what the impala tracks remind me of. And then, like Herbert's just spotted, he said, here's an adult tr track over here. You can see the very round tips, or well, the round back part of the foot, and then the, the tip of the toes going this way. Now, well, we know it's not the impala that we just saw because we only saw males there. And we know at this time of the year, with all the lambs being around, they're extremely vulnerable to what's going on out here. So mom likes to keep them tucked away in the bushes for a little bit. Let's see if we can perhaps find them. Maybe they're around here somewhere. It's a good area to stash a little lamb. So now what you can see Herbie is doing, he's walking, he's pointing out all the tracks as he goes along. We're going to continue to try and follow these and hopefully we get lucky and we manage to find one, but it may take us a bit of time. So let's jump back across onto Avia's vehicle and see what he's looking for now. All right. Quite disappointed in Taylor not wanting to do that. That challenge, but it's all understandable. That's all cool. Um, yeah, we'll we'll get it to practice a bit this afternoon, and maybe we'll get it to do one. Ah, some baboons. A troop of baboons. Ah, oh, come on, car. Let me go forward. There's one feeding, two feeding here, and some. What is that? Uh, and see what plant they were feeding on. I don't be shy, don't hide from us. That's a nice surprise. See, I told you we we're going to find something interesting, and it's crazy how quick these things happen. We've got one plan. I was trying to head to an area where we saw some water buck earlier, try and get them again, and then this pops up. Let me try and roll forward again. <laughs> 
It's crazy how shy these guys are. What were they feeding on? A white berry bush. I don't know if you can see the berries. White berry bush is quite tasty. Some people enjoy them. I'm not a big fan of it, but if I had to eat it, I would. Um, <laughs> to me, it tastes like uncooked corn. It's got a very powdery taste. Look at how that baby is being carried on the mum's belly. Easy access to the mammary glands. So yeah, these guys, they'll just move around through the bush looking for different things to feed on. Start rolling around old dung piles looking for insects that are in the dung. Let's go back a bit. Some of them are jumping into a marula there. Um, turn over rocks to see if they can catch any scorpions. Something quite interesting, you don't often see them with or around impalas this time of the year. You see the one in the tree there? Reason being with not being around impalas, they, the big males are known to catch the baby, so the impalas don't like being in their company at this time of the year. Um, other times of the year they they might spend time together the impala use them when they're sitting in a tree like this and they're feeding on flowers and fruits they're quite messy so they're dropping fruit and flowers and the impala are able to eat it it's one of the success stories of impalas being able to to eat a wide variety of food so grass leaves flowers whatever they they can get there get close to whatever is available they'll they'll eat so that helps a lot and that is one of the reasons why impala stayed relatively healthy through this dry period um also than some of the other species that were that are more specific to certain food types maybe pure grazers or only eating leaves but yeah with the drought i mean seeing things like buffalo eating leaves there's a tree called a round leafed teak and also further north in the Kruger Park there's a Mupani tree that the elephant ach, the buffalo spend quite a bit of time grazing on browsing on Brian there's some termites moving around just next to us here just in the shade busy carrying stuff power of those creatures being able to pull that piece of bark or leaf around must have <laughs> Termites have confused me a bit. I've been reading up on termites and the stories and stuff I knew about them and reading and finding a couple of different species and all that has really put me back a bit. <laughs> so I don't know which species this is specifically. Um, the ones that I knew of, they made little tunnels so we wouldn't see them moving around. They would have had these little tunnels move that they were moving in right. folks we're gonna head back to Taylor she's got a very nice surprise have fun 
we're just trying to get a view of it but we heard some squirrels shouting and we also had ah oh, there it's just gone there was a hyena it's just running on the other side of the drainage line and that is obviously we had also had some impala alarm calling and we initially suspected that it was shouting at us at us but of course a hyena is quite nervous of us especially out during the day because they can really see our size and well hyenas prefer it at night we'll see if we can get another view but it was on the move but it looked like it came from one of the termite mounds so let's go and investigate this termite mound and see maybe there's an active den i don't know but we'll go and investigate and have a little look and just see it just came out here and I think, Viam, wasn't there an old hyena den somewhere around here? Yeah. It's actually the, the big termite mound we're heading to apparently used to be an old hyena den. So if there are little cubs there, we're going to keep our distance. We're not going to stay for long and we'll rather call somebody else into the sighting that's not on foot. But we might as well go in and have a look very quickly. Let's come down here. But that was so exciting. It happened so quickly. Isn't that amazing? And I've been saying how the hyenas have been evading me all the time. We just hear them calling, see their tracks. And the only time I seem to see them is at night time at one o'clock in the morning when they are trying to steal all sorts of things. But I'm going to be very quiet now as we go through this drainage system. Don't do what I do. I almost fall over all the time. So Herbert's just walking up ahead. Oh my goodness, we've got to go up a mountain now. VM, are you ready for this? <laughs> VM says he's just engaged the flock and now he's ready. The easiest to go up with a bit of a dash. Anything, Herbie? Okay, so it seems as though there's not really much happening at this hyena den. Perhaps it was one that was maybe just resting. Maybe there was a puddle or something that it was laying in to keep cool for the morning. But we'll keep going and see if we can catch up with this hyena. But let's jump back across on Brent's vehicle. Well, we're still with Inkanyeni, who's playing peekaboo behind a log. Now, it is, as I said, getting warm. I'm not sure where the little rascal Vutome has moved off to. But I think they're not going to be too far from each other. And also think, I think they're going to be snoozing now for the rest of the day. It is heating up. Their big bellies are taking over. And uh, there are some other vehicles who are going to be making their way towards these incredible cats. And uh, if her head goes down, I don't think we're going to be able to see much of her. Now, Megan says a random question I know, but is a leopard's nose wet? Uh, not quite as wet as the dog's, but it, it'll be damp rather than wet, but sometimes depending on the time of year it can also be, be be quite dry but definitely not that sort of wet wet like a dog's nose and there she is oh she's popped her head up again as i said once she goes flat there we're not going to have much of a visual so i think we'll probably be leaving them i definitely think we'll follow up on the sunset safari see if they're still in this vicinity i think they should be especially if the heat gets uh, quite heavy today I think with those full bellies, there may be one or two more scraps of meat that they can garner off what's left of the impala in the tree, but not much. There we go. That head's getting heavier and heavier. Yeah. Tired mom. Well, looking after a young male leopard is a busy job. They tend to eat almost as much, if not, well, at this age, probably nearly, probably more than mom does. And there comes.
of the sun she's got herself some really nice shade. Now Alex is wondering why do her ears move so much? Well it's because of the biting flies Alex. There's a little species of fly called a stable fly that is quite a ravenous little blood sucker and there we go. Sometimes it'll even cause her to move which she's doing at the moment. So it's generally from the flies. Oh there we go. She's going to go a little bit deeper into that thicket and I think there we go. Head down. It's snoozing time. So I think we're going to leave the incredible in Kanyeni and I don't know where Mr. Vutomi is uh, to snooze but we will be back to look for them again on the sunset safari. Let's see if we can get one last little sneak peek through the fallen wood. One last little view. I can just make her out. There she is. She's got herself a nice bit of shade and a fallen leadwood tree. Bye bye Miss Nkanyen. Nice to see you again and hopefully we'll see you on the sunset safari as well. Uh, I'm going to start slowly making my way back towards Juma uh, while we do that. Let's go see what F is up to back on Juma. Hello, hello. We are at Twin Dams where Hosanna was crossing late on the afternoon safari yesterday. So let's keep wandering around here, see if there are any surprises. It's been a lovely morning so far, although we didn't have all the action-packed sightings that you've you've had with Brent. We've seen some amazing stuff, buffalo that that have haven't been around for a while. Those baboons were so entertaining. The impala early this morning. Um, Let's see what else of the smaller things will decide to show themselves. I'm so glad you got to see that interaction with with the with the cheetah and the zebra. One of my favorite sightings I've had with cheetah in interaction was actually interaction between cheetahs, uh, male cheetah and vultures. Uh, the male cheetah was on on a kill and busy feeding and then this huge amount of vultures just came down and started push, pushing this cheetah off, trying to push it off and eventually after a lot of snarling at them he had to leave it they were just there's just too much pressure and part of leaving it he could probably fight them off and keep them off but with all the vultures coming in other creatures would be attracted to it so lion hyena would be attracted and later on in the sighting there was a hyena that eventually stole the rest of the meat from the vultures so it was a smart move for the cheetah to move off. Sarah, you are asking if they have, if there's been any sightings of two cheetah in the Kruger. Um, So I just want to get that question. King Cheetah, sorry I missed that that part. Um, not that I'm aware of. King Cheetah you would mostly see in breeding projects where they do pop up every now and then. Um, but out in the wild they are not too successful. Unfortunately 
with the beauty comes a bit of a drawback in their camouflage and they stick out more so that I don't think they would survive for too long out here. I do know there are one of one or two here's some nice yellow billed hornbills. I do know there are a couple of breeding centers that have King Cheetah. There's one close to Hutsprate that they're quite well known for the King Cheetah. It's called the Hutsprate Endangered Species. We'll see one. Oh, that's a bit busy catching. These hornbills often also, like the baboons, will flick over old dung piles to look for for any insects in there. Yesterday morning on our, on our walk, we saw the wild wild sesame that had uh, that we washed that I washed my hands with. But the plant that we were looking at that at, at that stage didn't have any flowers on. Close to this close to this hornbill, there's one that's got a flower on it. Beautiful flower, beautiful pinkish flower. Go forward a bit more, see it a bit better. Just under that, let me quickly go and get it. Put it on the dashboard here so we can focus in. See how it looks like? It's got a bit of a landing strip almost guiding the insects in and the shape of it will also allow the insects to get the pollen on their bodies. The pollen all sits at the top of the flower. I don't know if we can look in there. So as this insect comes in to get the nectar, it gets the the pollen on it from the top, and as it flies off and goes to the next next plant, it gets the the plants fertilized like that. Quite a pretty little flower. Folks, let's carry on. We're going to see what else we can find. We're going to head over to Taylor. She's going to do a dr drone segment with you. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? Connor's just about flying past us now. I'm waving. Go, Connor, go. Your flying skills are absolutely incredible. Isn't that amazing? I didn't think that that drone could stay down so low. Wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> That is absolutely incredible and I hoped it looked as cool as what it looked uh, like to me and I can't wait to have a look at that footage. And we're always trying new different things when we're out here and of course out in the wilderness it's important to be able to get practice time like this. Now something that we haven't really spoken about today is flowers and, and there's a couple of them down here. There's still one I'm trying to look for. So we've got the beautiful string of stars which you are all very familiar with and very easy to identify. 
and I've managed to dig out my really big flower book. I had to blow off all the dust and bring it out of hiding and today I'm going to go through and I have got a whole lot of flowers that I've seen this morning that have, it looks like they've just popped up overnight so we're going to be doing a lot of identifying this afternoon and hopefully for the bushwalk uh, well again this afternoon uh, we'll be able to have a look at some of them in, in a little bit more more depth and it's just amazing how something like flowers just pop up overnight but we didn't really have too much success with our impala because I got so distracted of course with that hyena and we had a look at the mound there was a big excavation from that termite mound but possibly it was either from an aardvark or maybe even a warthog had gone through and utilized it and like Herbert said maybe it was sleeping in the drainage system to keep out of the heat of the day maybe right on that termite mound or maybe it was a female that was out scouting looking for a possible uh, new den site so that's quite exciting we don't know we can only speculate but I hope it's the second option and that it is indeed out and about uh, looking for a new den site now Larry you're wondering if we've got a lot of poison ivory ivy in here in Africa we don't we don't quite have uh, too much of a poison ivy but there's there's lots of other stuff out here that stings and we'll see if we can find some there's a sting net that can be quite invasive that grows in certain areas. I haven't ever found too much of it. I only saw it once down in the south and that can be quite nasty. It's covered with prickly hairs and if it gets onto your leg, if you just brush past it, you break out in a big rash, very similar to what poison ivy would sort of do to you. And you have to put an antihistamine on because it burns as well as it itches the worst of the two combinations that you can have. Luckily, you, said, you sort of see it in meadows and fields and things, like I said, in poor disturbed areas, normally around um, sort of human habitations. Not too much of it up here, uh, luckily, out in the bush. Because can you imagine walking around with our bare legs? We'd brush up all over that uh, stinging nettle, and that wouldn't be too fun. It would be the same thing, I suppose, though, as walking through all these little small grasses and getting a hairy caterpillar on your leg. I suppose so we've got to watch out for them too. It's not just the plants and things. But I wanted to come and see if there were any, maybe any skinks that were out and about this morning on this fallen marula tree. This is a good place. I think if I was a, a lizard of some sort, I'd probably hang around here. Let's have a quick look. Hmm. Possibly it's not warm enough for them just yet. It seems as though they're hiding. But remember the other other morning, a couple of mornings ago, we pulled back a bit, a couple of pieces of bark, and we found some big tropical house geckos. Let's see what we've got here. Hmm. Can you see how beautiful that is? Can you see that green and metallic blue? It looks like it's probably the exoskeleton of maybe a jewel beetle. Maybe it molted or perhaps something ate it. There's only little remnants of it left here. But sadly, no lizards. Let's try this piece. Let's see what's under here. Nope, nothing in this one. We're not having very much luck with this marina tree, are we? And well, this is what you have to do. You have to go investigating. Now, like I said, when you come to areas like this, you do want to be very, very careful. You don't want to of course, uh, be too brave and, and stand on too many unturned logs. Oh, what have you got, Vim? Did you have one? Oh, there we go, well spotted. And that's just because, of course, the snakes and things around here. Now you're looking at a very small skink at the moment, but it will grow into something big. It's probably maybe the striped skink. There's quite a few different species around. And well, it's still very little. And you can see why they'd want to take refuge on something like a marula tree because their pattern and their markings blend in so well. It didn't like me standing up on its marula tree so it disappeared behind a big sheet of bark which will keep it nice and safe. But you better be careful because if a hornbill finds you, well, it will probably eat that lizard. Now, it's been a wonderful morning and I hope that you have all enjoyed it just as much as we have been out here walking around on Juma Private Game Reserve. But it's time for us to say goodbye, but we'll see you again this afternoon. So for myself, Viam, and of course Herbert, we hope you have a wonderful day wherever you may be in the world. But let's go back across to Evia, who I think would also like to say goodbye this morning.
Folks, it's been a lovely morning out in the bush. Clouds are building. We're really hoping it's going to stay as promising as it looks. We might get a bit of rain this afternoon. Um, a couple of memorable sightings for myself. The impalas we had this morning and all the interaction was brilliant. You had lovely cheetah and leopard. Nice tracks as well. Um, I want to really try and see something before we head back to camp. Let's see if there's something interesting out and about. Um, I'd like to thank Brian and the Thumb for helping me out this morning and showing me the roads. I'm still learning the road network. It's a bit confusing, but we'll get there. Um, yeah, just thank you for sharing the whole area and the beauty of Africa with us. Let's see what is let's see what else is gonna show itself before before we head back to camp. There's a bit of water just in front, maybe we get lucky with something coming down for a drink. Some Egyptian geese at the water. <laughs> and some of the river systems in in our area they their numbers are growing constantly. And some of the big rivers like the Willifants River, you see them in massive flocks. I've probably seen a hundred or so of them together and they're quite noisy and they start fighting amongst each other there's a massive amount of noise that come from there and if you're sleeping out in the bush especially on a moonlit night it's quite tough to to fall asleep with all the noise that these guys make every movement everything triggers a bit of alarm calling fighting amongst each other just crazy. <laughs> Folks, once again, thank you for a lovely morning. And hopefully our luck will continue on all the different things that we've seen. And I'm very excited for this afternoon's drive. We'll see you then. Thank you again, Brian, and the thumb. It's been lovely. We're going to head over to Brent. Well, there we go, a little Sten Borky hiding in the bushes, not disappearing at a rate of knots like we used to. Just obviously feels safe. There's enough vegetation between us and her. And there she walks off. Now, what an exciting sunrise safari this has been. Uh, we have been very lucky. Dave, well done. You've brought some good luck. I mean, leopard and cheetah on cheetah planes again. Two of them, yes, two and two is four, just in case anyone was wondering. But, and as Effie just said, we're going to be doing this again in a few short hours for the Sunset Safari, and uh, hopefully you'll be with us for that. Now, very interesting that after not seeing Cheetah for five months, <laughs> in twice, in, twice in, a, in, in a week or so, so I'm very happy. And of course, I was really ecstatic to catch up with my favorite female leopard in Kanyeni and uh, actually get a good look at Vutomi. Uh, I haven't seen Vutomi. The last time we saw Vutomi was actually with Dave as well, and those cubs were not even eight months old. So it has been really good. He's grown up, and he looks like he's got quite a mischievous character. So we'll see. Is he going to play for Hosanna's uh, spot in my heart? Who's going to take my favorite young male leopard at the moment? But uh, also, Valma just mentioned that a lot of people out there don't know what Boney M is because I keep saying we need to share all the Boney M songs on James's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Now, Boney M is the probably one of the most cringeworthy bands that have ever come out of the Americas. Uh, they're, uh, I think they were a soul group, but they did a Christmas album that sold millions worldwide. How, I do not know. It is possibly, uh, I would consider being 
tied down and making made listen to the Boney M Christmas album to be serious form of torture. Ah, um, we're gonna so just to have a look on YouTube and type in Boney M Christmas special and then take it and put it on James's Facebook page. But anyway, from Dangerous Dave, The Dish, and myself, we will see you for the Sunset Safari. Uh, toodaloo and.